uh, we can get uh, started. Uh, so I would like to welcome everyone to this uh, ECE department uh, webinar. And today's webinar will be given by uh, Professor Bharadwaj Amrutur. Uh, Professor Bharadwaj is, a, is the chairman of uh, the Robert Bart Center for Cyber Physical Systems, and he's also a faculty in, uh, in the ECE department. And uh, uh, Professor Bharadwaj also heads the AI and Robotics Technology Park, formerly known as Art Park, which is an initiative between AI Foundry and IASC. Uh, the goal of this uh, park is to bring uh, innovative startups in the area of robotics and autonomous systems. And, and Bharadwaj is a recipient of many awards, and so the, uh, some, some of them being uh, Satish Dhawan uh, Young Investigator Award, uh, and also the Abdul Kalam uh, Technology Innovation uh, Fellow. So with that introduction, I would uh, hand over the controls to Bharadwaj uh, for his webinar. Uh, thank you, Varun, for the kind introduction. I hope you can hear uh, hear me. And uh, you know, I the network in my home has an habit of randomly conking off. So if that happens, uh, it usually comes back in a, in a few minutes. So uh, so please have patience. So uh, uh, I'll just uh, get into the slideshow mode. And uh, uh, so I've been the last uh, maybe two years or so, uh, I've been kind of excited by this uh, topic of uh, tele control of machines. And, uh, um, you know, in the beginning, I thought it was, I mean, it was kind of interesting. And, you know, I thought, how hard can it be? But as I started, you know, <laughs> spending time more and more thinking about it, uh, I realized that there is a lot of complexity and a lot of very interesting uh, challenges uh, uh, for research as well as engineering, as well as huge uh, possibilities for application uh, uh, for many different problems. And uh, so I believe that this could be the next paradigm for uh, uh, smart machines. And uh, hopefully I can uh, kind of share some of my thoughts as to why I think uh, that is the that is the case. Uh, so what I've indicated out here is a, a somewhat continuum of uh, machines uh, of tasks which on the left side are fully automated to uh, the tasks on the right which are uh, not at all automated right so on the left side uh, we have a, a modern computer server which is uh, you know kind of the paragon of automation right i mean everything happens automatically in the server uh, all kinds of software uh, agents and pieces uh, managing things uh, programs running and so on uh, and then when, when you get out from the cyber, pure cyber world into the physical world, the, the levels of automation start decreasing. Next to it is, a, is our uh, good old washing machine, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which is something which you put in your clothes, you put in some powder and it, it completes the washing. And of course you also have dryers and then it, it dries and then of course, and, and then some uh, the recent invention in Japan, in Japan, it also folds the clothes and keeps it ready for you. But um, it's, uh, it, it is something certainly where uh, you have gone to the next level of automating some of the physical tasks also. Uh, next to that is this earth mover, uh, where now you actually have a machine which is operated by a human driver uh, who is sitting in that cage out there. And uh, he actually controls uh, the earth mover arms to actually remove and, uh, uh, the mud and stones and all that. And uh, what the machine does is it helps to do a force multiplication. Right? I mean, uh, th that is one of the, the main benefits of this. Uh, it provides you a mechanical advantage. But you still need the human to really maneuver the machine around, you know, and really figure out where to position the arm, you know, and so on, how much to kind of uh, stretch it and things like that, right? So it's, uh, there, is, there is mechanization, but no automation. And then on the right, Rightmost top, you see the uh, lady harvesting coffee berries. Uh, it's a purely manual process. Uh, you have to know where the coffee seeds are, you know what are which are ripe enough, and pluck them. And these seeds are pretty small, so you need to be able to maneuver your fingers and hands in there and get it out. Right? And then in the bottom, uh, you know, uh, you have this nurse uh, who is uh, <clears throat> this is a mannequin, of course, uh, so that you don't gross out, but. Is a very important task for managing the patients in you know, a patient care, which is to uh, uh, really, you know, use this bedpan and clean the patient and all that, right? And uh, and the tasks on the right are very routine 
mechanical jobs, right? I mean, that is the whole point of automation and uh, AI is to help relieve the burden of doing routine mechanical work. Right now it has succeeded in relieving the burden for cognitive, routine cognitive tasks. And this is where robotics and the future is coming in where even routine mechanical tasks uh, could potentially be taken over and done by machines. One of the characteristics, if you go from left to right, is the increasing, within course, unstructuredness, right? I mean, it's a very, uh, the environment has no structure uh, from a machine's perspective. The coffee berries could be anywhere. The patient could be, you know, in any position. The patient, uh, uh, you know, could be of different sizes, uh, different, you know, frailties, etc. right? And uh, so that is really the next frontier in terms of uh, robotic automation is to be able to uh, crack this problem of solving the automation problem in this in, in, in this environment of unstructuredness. And uh, that is where I feel uh, to get to that, which is the holy grail, it, it's going to take some some uh, some time, but there's an intermediate step, which is a teleoperation. And I'll explain what that is. And the idea here is that, um, you know, instead of fully figuring out the, all the algorithms for the machine to operate by itself, um, you cannot take a step-by-step -step approach where you still have a human, but human need not be in the machine, right? Human need not be where the work needs to be done, but the human is separated out. And uh, uh, and then the human kind of operates uh, the machine. Now you might say, why is this, I mean, there are, why is this useful, right? I mean, why not just have the human do it? I mean, there are, there are some benefits to doing this and we'll kind of see that in the next slide. Uh, of course, you know, now it is very clear for the bottom image that the nurse operating the robotic uh, machine, you know, especially in a very highly infectious situation, we can see the benefit if we had that kind of a technology. Right? So there are reasons why this would, is, is makes a lot of sense. And then this also could be a step towards full autonomy. And this teleoperation has been around, you know, many of us have experienced this uh, uh, in the kids, certainly on the left, if you see, uh, it's a favorite toy for many a kid to play around with uh, remote controlled uh, toys. Uh, but uh, there is some noise from someone, I, if, my, if I may request people to go on mute, that will help with that, thanks. Uh, and then you have, uh, you have, uh, of course, practical other applications, practical applications of remote control technology, uh, really in defense. We have seen some examples in the recent past of how uh, some of these, uh, uh, you know, weaponized uh, platforms have been used. Uh, they are used for mine detection and other things. And uh, 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 a great success in medical field and surgery has been this tele, uh, not tele surgery. I mean, essentially, this surgery where the, the, the surgeon is operating the uh, surgical equipment uh, through this, uh, in an indirect way, right, uh, through this interface. And then, of course, uh, space exploration, we all know. Um, you know, we have seen the recent examples uh, uh, of uh, the Mars uh, rovers and so on. And uh, what we see, again, going from left to right is uh, there is some, you know, which is the increasing, shall we say, uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, distance and the communication distance between the controller and the controlled object. Uh, and that is a very important aspect which I'll discuss uh, shortly as we go forward. Now this uh, teleoperation as a concept has been around for a very long time. And in fact, uh, uh, I was doing a little bit of history uh, study just to kind of get a perspective of this. And uh, basically what, I've, what, uh, what it, it appears is that in the 1940s, uh, just uh, at the anvil of the, uh, the nuclear age, at the dawn of the nuclear age, uh, the US uh, Atomic Energy Commission already realized that uh, to handle these kinds of nuclear materials safely, uh, it would make sense to do it in a tele-operated way, right? develop some kind of a through the wall master slave manipulator so that uh, the uh, highly radioactive materials can be managed. And they launched this program to develop this uh, technology. I think at the, around the same time, the US Navy also realized that, um, you know, there is a lot of need for operating equipment under the sea. Uh, for example, just maintenance of uh, the, the ships while they are already in the C 
taxi, you know, you had to go down and do something. Uh, you could also have uh, equipment, underwater equipment, marine equipment, which go down and which do something uh, in the seabed. And so this led to the development of the first submersible with a teleoperable arm, which was fitted outside the vehicle. And uh, so this, this field was uh, kind of undergoing further intellectual and uh, engineering development. And there was a very interesting, uh, uh, I would say, uh, classic article, which I'll also refer to a little bit as we go further, uh, by Sheridan and his colleague at MIT, where they developed this concept of different roles of uh, the computer and human in a teleoperation, as well as different levels of teleoperation. And uh, this is the We saw some example has already been in widespread use for many decades. And uh, most of the time, the human is in complete control of the machine. Uh, the, the machine is like a slave in some sense. Uh, of course, in the, in the context of uh, the space exploration, uh, that cannot fully be done that way because of the huge latencies. That's where the machines have some local autonomy to do uh, things and figure out things for themselves. And uh, uh, in hello. Is there any question? I hope I'm audible and you can see the slide. Yes, yes, you're audible. Okay. Uh, and then this word uh, teleautonomous system, I kind of found, I think it was coined in 1980, late 80s by Lynn Conway, who is also well known for uh, many other contributions uh, in uh, computer architecture and you know, VLSI and other areas. And they kind of coined the word, I, I believe, of teleautonomous systems, you know, really to capture this uh, notion that uh, the machines, even though they are teleoperated, could still, the machines themselves could have some ability to locally make decisions, right, which we see, which is important in cases uh, like space exploration and so on. And uh, over the last decade or so, I think there have been a lot of uh, research work and papers on this concept of this kind of shared autonomy between humans and machines. And that has, of course, been spurred by other advances, related advances in artificial intelligent algorithms, which are based on machine learning and, re and you know, reinforcement learning, its variants. So, uh, so in Sheridan's paper, he, you know, it's a, it's a nicely articulates the whole concept of uh, teleoperation, where in top cartoon image, uh, he kind of talks about the direct control, where the human operator uh, is directly controlling the vehicles, uh, actuators, arms, cameras, etc. Right, and then the camera data is fed directly to the human uh, uh, to kind of see through a display. So this is uh, kind of what uh, you know we have seen also with this remote control toys in some sense. Though of course in remote control toys you don't actually have a display; you just have a control. Right? So it just adds to the cost. Then uh, he articulates a concept of supervisory control, where the human doesn't necessarily control every little movement uh, and operation of the machine. Right? The human kind of gives a higher level goal to the machine, so it's kind of supervisory control. And uh, to, to enable that to happen, you really need uh, two computers, one at the human end and the other at the remote end. And uh, one of the terminologies which has emerged I think in this area is this op operator end and the teleoperator end. So I'll just try to refer to that so that just makes it easier. Uh, so this is kind of pretty much where we are, uh, the supervisory control. I think this is kind of the uh, the prototype systems which we have. Uh, the variation which we could have as we go forward is uh, uh, many to many. That is, uh, you can think of multiple human operators controlling controlling multiple human machines. That's kind of the generalization which. Um, hasn't yet happened, I think. Uh, even one too many probably has not happened that much, but uh, we don't see too many practical examples of that. So one operator controlling many machines and then many operators controlling many machines. I think those are interesting directions for this kind of technology to evolve. And, and I'm sure that, and, and there are a lot of challenges to make that happen and uh, it's an interesting area uh, for research and exploration further. Uh, Sheridan also very beautifully, I think this figure captures uh, the role of the computer, right? So in this figure, uh, L is, stands for the load or the task that needs to be done. H is the human and C is the computer. On the left is the classical way where a human pretty much handles the whole load. 
and uh, then when you bring in the computer then you can do it in a sharing way where uh, the computer extends the capability of the human or the computer helps to kind of augment and take off some of the burden from the human to do the task um and then on the on, on the on the right is where the human gets replaced or traded by the computer and this requires full autonomy where a computer can take over when a human uh, is unable to or you just don't need a human at all right so uh, of course that is the most sensitive in some sense uh, from a societal and political perspective uh, that uh, firstly of course technologically i think many tasks are still quite difficult but on the other hand also there are implications uh, from a societal and political perspective of trying to replace a human uh, which will kind of uh, <clears throat> i think we are some way off but it's something to keep in mind as we kind of uh, develop this kind of uh, technology so what are some of the uh, kind of challenges uh, essentially to um realize this uh, technology to its fullest uh, promise right and i wanted a few which i think are kind of uh, important out here uh, one is uh, of course the communication latency and its brittleness right um you know and how do you kind of what do you do to overcome these inefficiencies of the communication network yet uh, kind of make sure that you are able to achieve the task uh, with this tele operation uh, the second is related to Uh, recreating when you have a tele operator uh, who's uh, uh, kind of far away from where the machine is and you want the tele operator to make decisions um you need to be able to provide the operator with the perspective of what the machine is seeing the element of the machine um and i think that is uh, that's kind of also an interesting uh, problem and interesting challenge and uh, because only if you do that you will be able to enable good decision making by the human um and then you have the human of course has some de- you know lots of degrees of freedom of expressing themselves and the machines have their own degrees of freedom and you need to match them right so you need to match the actions of what the human does and and more um, in recent times even the intent of what the human wants to do and get and convey that to the machine and get it done at the machine so that you have effective actions by the machine and uh finally as we go forward thanks to the advances in ai technologies uh you can now actually increase the level of abstraction of interaction between the human and the machine right now i don't need to move the joystick and uh, going by exactly that amount forward in fact i can raise the level of abstraction and kind of instruct what needs to be done uh, and uh, have the machine figure out and do it so these are i mean you know while there are advances i think there's still a lot of very interesting problems and research questions still so i think it's an interesting research areas to explore so let me just kind of uh, spend a little bit of time to uh, discuss some of these challenges as to what people have done and, and you know there is some work we have done of course we have just scratched the surface it's kind of a new area for us but uh, i think it's a very exciting area as we go forward um so this communication latency of course people from controls uh, background know very well that the whenever you have a feedback loop then the delay of the feedback loop is very critical right for the stability of the system so that is kind of well known um and in the context of an end to end application people have also studied this and uh, of course delays are very critical right in terms of performance so what is shown out here is a graph which is uh which which was actually experimentally uh, <clears throat> uh shall we say uh, with, with experimental you know they got the data through experiments with humans to operate uh, this uh, surgical equipment we saw a picture of the surgical equipment earlier and uh, they got this new surgeons to uh, were training surgeons in training to actually learn to use the equipment to do a uh, two task you know the tasks are labeled tubes 2 and energy dissection 1 so it's probably not very important what those exact tasks are the point here is that the 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 surgeons and then they had a way to adjust the delay of the uh, network in between the where the the surgeon is operating and the actual equipment right and then they measured the amount of time it took them to actually complete the work and they found that 
the latency has a very high significant impact and the task completion time actually went up exponentially right uh, with the latency and uh, <clears throat> so so of course for, for this particular study for surgery they felt they, they, they from this they kind of got this number that the end-to-end latency has to be less than 200 milliseconds and uh, this kind of work has been studied further uh, by other authors and uh, what I'm showing out here is a table from this recent work by Zhang et al. in 2018 uh, where they look at <coughs> um, you know different kinds of uh, feedback which uh, a surgeon could get. Um, so the top few rows are when you get real-time multimedia streams, the middle ones are around physical signs, vital signs, and uh, the bottom most one is when the surgeon is also able to get a haptic feedback. And what they are articulating out here is what are the requirements on the latency, jitter, and the packet loss rate from a network perspective. And uh, this is a, a kind of a survey paper. It's a nice paper, and they have kind of put together uh, studies by other groups, and they have created this table. And uh, I just wanted to highlight the uh, the bottom most one with the red box. Um, and here, uh, this is the the latency requirement uh, for the communication network is uh, about if you want to work with realistic force and vibration feedback you need the latencies to be less than, uh, you know, uh, for 10 milliseconds, right? About, you know, about five milliseconds or less. And the correspondingly low jitter and low packet uh, loss rate. So, you know, if you have a wired network and if those things are close by, it's really not a problem. And that's why you have these companies like Intuitive Surgical and others who have been able to, uh, you know, actually sell these machines and surgeons have been able to effectively use them. The challenge really comes when these two are separated out and you also have a wireless network in between. Right? So that's that's really where, and, and of course it has its own benefits of using a wireless network. Uh, so, so, so driven by these kinds of applications, uh, the 3GPP group uh, has released uh, the specs. Um, I have so, a question, I have a question, sir, on the last slide, this is Rahul. Um, yeah. On the, on the earlier slide. So basically, my question is that uh, uh, number one, uh, these kind of latency measurement, uh, are they from the point of view of the experience of the person doing the surgery? Or they are from the point of view of something like in this case of surgery leading to fatality if this latency is not maintained? Uh, that is a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, if you see the previous work out here, uh, they are only talking about uh, the task completion time, right? They are not even talking about the errors introduced, right? Say, imagine you want to cut a little, uh, uh, you know, kind of muscle fiber, and then due to latency, you kind of over position yourself and cut something else, right? I mean, yeah. they're not even talking of those kinds of errors, but you know, clearly, uh, so these numbers are obtained by uh, kind of, you know, you have to kind of, if you want to do experimental. Uh, studies you have to do, you know, these kinds of studies where you kind of look at things like how long it takes to complete a particular task or how mm -hmm. efficient is a task done. For example, uh, you might actually have a lot of movement before you are able to do the job you want to do, right? Suppose your job is to go and touch a particular object, then you mm -hmm. might kind of fumble around a lot and then touch, and then you can look at the total path length, for example, right? So you, you kind of, these, these things are done through that kind of studies. Of course, <laughs> you can't do it on real humans. But uh, clearly, the requirement for fatality being, brings in, uh, you know, I, I think they kind of spec this, taking that into account also. Yeah, in some sense. So, but, so then the part two of the question is, uh, which is more of a conjecture here rather than a question, but I want your expert comment on that. I have not uh, read any of these papers. So the question is that we were talking about certain abstraction. Let us assume a scenario where for certain uh, limitations or constraint, we are not able to achieve the desirable latency for a certain application with whatever network feasibility we have. With the best effort also, we are not able to meet certain latency constraint, uh, desirable latency constraint with whatever network implementation we have. In that case, uh, 
can we still improve the experience you talked about being fumbled or you know uh, rather making errors which can be fatal can we use the abstraction to abstract out those i mean do yeah. what is your comment on that i think I'll, I'll talk about some of the work going on in the next few slides and uh, certainly i think uh, uh, you know but from a uh, what i would say is from an engineering perspective uh, if you are making a machine uh, and you're selling this technology to someone to use in such a critical case like uh, you know kind of doing surgery on a patient and so on i think i think it's important to make sure you have a really good network right engineered to begin with it and then you can do other things on top of it otherwise uh, uh, you know but then you know you try to try your best on your network design and then of course you do other things on top of it so i, I think that network is a foundational fundamental thing i think um, but you know these latency numbers are really challenging i don't think our current networks are there yet uh, wireless networks certainly so um so that is the aspiration with 5g and uh, beyond is to really look at how to uh, really push the network uh, specs uh, where you can potentially do these kinds of things so what i've shown here i've just taken this from the release 17 which is going to be released uh in 2022 i guess as uh, uh and, and, you know and and then what this uh, just looked at the the url llc which is ultra reliable low latency communication essentially meant for mobile robots and uh, they have kind of envisioned four different use cases out here uh, cooperative robot control video based remote control standard robotics and video streaming and uh, the second row i've just highlighted that because that is kind of the most challenging in some sense and uh, uh, very high reliability requirements you see out here the columns 1 column 2 uh which is the mean time <laughs> between failures of at least a year um and then you look at the uh, latencies you know between 10 to 100 milliseconds but this is also in the context of having video and such high bandwidth data streams going uh back and forth right and um, uh so so you, it's a very challenging spec uh, you know where you could also have high speed mobility and uh, lots of devices and a large range uh so this is uh, a kind of uh, something which is uh, uh what we in the ec department were looking at uh, as a, a target as we go forward for the 5g for ur llc uh to try to hit this um of course now i you know given you know so, so th that is essentially something with the network design the you know you, you really optimize uh, uh, your layer 1 layer 2 etc etc right now given the network you have right and this is comes to the question which uh, rahul asked what can you do you have a network uh, i have to live with that network can i still do useful things from a tele operation perspective right and how do i how do i do that and there has been quite a bit of work in this area and clearly uh, you know i'll just kind of pick a few uh, you know i just kind of came across in the <laughs> in the short time i was looking at this uh, which i thought were interesting and i can share with you um, so there was a recent work which was looking at um, how you know a lot of these applications you have multiple types of streams right uh, you could have video and audio type Uh, media streams and you can have control and you know you can have sensors like force and uh, touch sensor force sensor and so on which are much low data rate and uh, uh, and then you have the reverse direction of control coming in and the thing with uh, force and uh, haptics is that as we saw in the slides uh, earlier there is a requirement that it has to be less than 5 milliseconds right and that's what these authors are trying to also do is to develop the scheme of multiplexing these various uh, data rates uh, sorry data data types onto this channel and this application level uh, optimization they are doing where they smartly estimate and control how they mux and how they send uh, between these various streams by getting a sense for the channel right and uh, they have uh, <coughs> they they get some feedback a uh, back from the receiver and then they use that to estimate the rate and they adjust how they mix these different flows they adjust the buffer depths of these videos and audio streams and so on so it's just a uh, uh, you know it's kind of in some sense uh, common sense is what you would do uh, but what is interesting out here as we go forward uh, is what we have started thinking about uh, uh, with uh, along with our colleagues 
uh, in ce and our park is how do we kind of you know can kind i of create a general framework where you can actually enable this kind of uh, uh, qs aware flows to get mapped to the underlying network right uh, and take advantage if the network also provides such qs capabilities and so on this some work uh, which uh, uh, our uh, colleagues in ec uh, you know we uh, we can have did this uh, where we looked at how you know with focus on a very specific problem of uh, um, you know when you have this uh, large networks you have multiple uh, kind of uh, stations right and then your connection gets handed over from one station to another so even though the two endpoints remain the same the intermediate nodes can get handed over in a wireless type setting and this handover can actually uh, <laughs> you know can can, can uh, take up a lot of latency to do the handover and so uh, so along uh, with professor uh, himanshu parimal aditya and the group uh, we can kind have of looked at how to optimize these handovers in the context of this kind of a tele driving operation so on the left you see is this vehicle outside our ec department and on the right is a picture seen through the vehicle and uh, the operator is uh, trying to operate the vehicle by controlling the vehicle's movement and uh, what you see out here is the entire end to end system where you have the vehicle and we are bringing out the various important elements out here because we you know we kind of realize that it's not just the communication but the other things also which add to the delay and the end to end delay is really important from application perspective so the vehicle itself is sampling the scene and there is a sampling delay right i mean if you are sampling at 30 frames per second you have at least 30 milliseconds uh you know you lose 30 milliseconds there right uh, um, uh, on an average 15 milliseconds i guess then um, uh, you have to encode that and especially with uh, high quality and you could have multiple video cameras right for you to be able to see it and that encoding uh, can take a lot of uh, time and then you of course the network transmission including handoffs all that and then you have to decode it and render it and then the human sees it and makes a decision right so this end to end latency turns out for a driving application uh, we can have estimated and others have also kind of estimated that it should be less than 100 milliseconds end to end right uh, so only then you can do reasonably uh, you know uh, it won't it won't degrade from your driving if you were to actually sit in the vehicle right? so that is the target end to end latency of less than 100 milliseconds so uh, so what is shown on the table out here is uh, you know unoptimized and optimized uh, uh, you know but there's some engineering optimization which is done to uh, enable this handover to happen so you know so so it's uh, I, i think there's pretty straightforward optimization uh, which was done but the point is that when you do that uh, you can actually uh, Uh, bring down the latency when you don't have a handoff but when you have you know uh, of course you 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 cannot bring down the latency even without handoff so to from 230 to 93 but uh, with handoffs it comes from 600 to 250 milliseconds so it is still not good enough uh, by the way for the application but that's kind of what we were able to do with our network out here so this is again a very interesting problem uh, especially in these kinds of wifi networks uh, and other networks where you have the problem of handoffs and so on and how do you kind of optimize it and i think there's uh, quite a bit of work which has already happened in terms of doing some prediction and things like that so uh, what we want to do with this is that uh, our goal and and uh, has been to actually show this uh, tele operation uh, uh, of this uh, vehicle which we call trusty and you will see why we call it trusty because uh, it is uh, rust colored <laughs> and uh, orange color and it, it's all the something we believe we can trust in once we figure out all the cards so this is a vehicle from a uh, 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 company called transvahan and you might have seen their e rickshaws all around in the campus right and uh, so we have modified this vehicle so that you can actually tele operate it right now ashish is operating the vehicle sitting in the vehicle because in the initial test we want to make sure that Uh, you know things don't run away and we are able to kind of take take over control of it and uh, it's been a significant engineering to actually get this thing done i mean even though i mean no it's, you know of course if you could buy this like you could get vehicle platforms which open up the apis and you could use it but in this stage of the project we thought it's good for us to figure out how to do these things and uh, so this vehicle is now in a in a shape which is ready to be driven around over the network 
and uh, once the lockdown is uh, we come out of the lockdown we hope to kind of uh, drive this vehicle over the entire campus so our initial thought was just do it in the uh in of course in front of the ec department we have our uh, uh, so here you see the brakes being actuated so brakes are the most critical ones so you, you want to be able to stop if things go wrong and uh, uh, yeah so we uh, of course besides operating in front of the ec Is using it? our 5g uh, or i should i should say 4g plus plus equipment uh, we also want to drive it around the entire campus using the standard airtel 4g network uh, which we believe is uh, reasonably decent for this kind of operation. Uh, that is what uh, some of the early measurements are showing. So, and one of the benefits for of this kind of uh, operation is that uh, it also allows us to collect a lot of data and could eventually lead also to a full autonomous uh, solution, uh, which uh, which is uh, it's kind of like a bridge to get to full autonomy. Uh, the benefit of uh, something like this, uh, you know, is that um, firstly the transfer operator have to, has told us that his most significant cost in his operation in the campus is the drivers, not paying for the drivers. Uh, the second thing is if you don't have a driver in the vehicle, you get one more seat uh, space. Uh, and uh, of course it might also be more comfortable for people if, uh, you know, especially in the night and so on, uh, if you're able to go in a vehicle where you don't have people whom you don't know along with you in the vehicle. Uh, and then the vehicle, of course, is tele-operated, so you, know, you can still make, hopefully make it work in a, a reliable and safe way. So that is our uh, kind of uh, uh, vision for where we see with this tele-driving and why we thought we should look at this as a technology, uh, so, so, uh, as a use case for our 5G effort uh, in, the, in the department. Uh, 5G URLLC effort. Uh, so one very important requirement as we, you know, as we started doing these kinds of work, we realized that you need to be able to simulate, right, the uh, impact of the network and your choices, uh, both in the network design, protocol design, etc., in a uh, on the actual robots, and. Uh, and, and that is where we realize that there is a need for a co-simulation. While you have good simulators for networks uh, like NS3 and Mininet and so on, you also have good simulators for robots, uh, which actually work, which, which are based on physics engines, which do actually a uh, solution of uh, differential equations to kind of calculate the robot states. Uh, you, need a, you need a combination of both, right? so that you can actually simulate such kinds of you know teleoperation or network of robots and so on, and so um, and so that's when uh, one of our PhD students, Sri Krishna, started working on this. And uh, so we, you know we, we have a simulator which we call Cornet, co-simulation of robots and networks. And what this simulator does is it it couples Gazebo, which is I mean you know, Gazebo is just one of the civics engine. It could be any other civics engine uh, in some in some sense. It couples that with uh, uh, a, a network simulator called Mininet. Initially, we had started with NS, but then we went to Mininet. And uh, an important problem to solve out here is uh, the problem of synchronizing time, because physics engines work on this. You know, uh, you know, time is discretized in you know kind of fixed intervals, and time progresses. Whereas network simulators are usually event-driven, so you need to kind of match the time between the two and that was one innovation which uh, Sri Krishna did out here of how to synchronize time using some framework. I won't go into details of this. It's kind of early version is published in a paper earlier. And uh, that is what is shown out in this graph where, uh, you know, if you don't, you know, if you don't synchronize the time explicitly, you know, you measure round trip times and it appears differently both in Mininet or when you look at it from Gazebo, right? And actually, whereas you want them to both have the same view of time. And that is what uh, is shown on the right, saying that this approach actually is working well. Um, so we hope to kind of use it uh, for many different problem statements uh, as we go along. Uh, so, you know, so that was actually uh, how, you know, people are spending uh, are trying to kind of improve the network latency right, at different levels. Right? Uh, and then now you can actually look at, you know, given you know what can you do beyond that, right? Um, can you hide latency? Um, and uh, this was of course uh, already known a long time back uh, in the 80s itself, where one of the ideas proposed was why not 
uh, do a simulation in the operator side. Right? The operator does something, and uh, you predict. You know, don't wait for uh, the signal to go. The actual machine doing something, and then you get the information back. Right. So this is half T communication. Don't wait for T of delay. You just uh, essentially predict what will happen so that you know the operator can kind of uh, do a better job right so they set up this kind of a system where they had a way of simulating what happened and rendering that and they actually found in this graph so these are actual you know tasks again they measure the time task completion time and these tasks are like for example they will be objects of different colors and they'll have a robot arm and they'll want to try to touch these objects in certain order or move them around and things like that right so what they found is that uh, if you look at these two graphs out here, these two curves, TCOM and TCOM2, uh, greater than TCOM1, right? So the communication delays increase, and so the task completion time increases. Uh, and then when they introduce this forward simulation, they find that they can actually reduce the task completion time. Right? So this is based on their experiments they did with actual human operators working with this. So this is a kind of a approach where you could uh, model what is being seen the other side, and uh, you know, and then the operator can take advantage of that, and uh, the overall system will be reduces, right? And uh, you can also look at processing on the teleop side, right, on the top side, so to speak. And again, there are multiple different ways, and I'm just kind of sampling a couple of works out here, which I thought uh, might be interesting, and to trigger further thoughts and maybe further directions for research, right? Uh, so here what happens is that in this particular work uh, uh, by this group uh, uh, from, uh, actually I forget which university they are from, but this is kind of published in 2013. I think maybe uh, so Stanford. Dragan, okay. Uh, so here what they That's have is, uh, yeah. So here uh, they have a human operator controlling the robot. Uh, but they have, uh, uh, what they do is, the, the robot also in its local computer uh, runs some kind of an algorithm, right? I mean, uh, to generate an action policy. Uh, it could be a controller, uh, you know, typical controller, or it could be uh, kind of uh, some kind of a reinforcement learning uh, agent, which is de developing the policies or whatever, right? And then what they proposed to do was to blend uh, the two actions, right? Uh, in a linear way, so the uh, parameter alpha essentially <clears throat> controls the how much, and th this kind of works, of course, for continuous type policies, uh, continuous type actions, right? I mean, where uh, you can actually do this kind of a linear combination of the the action. The action could be the velocity uh, target for the motor, or you know, the force, uh, the torque value for the motors, and so on. And uh, so this is kind of. Uh, uh, basically what they do where the user input is used uh, along with the prediction from the robot and they are blended through this. Uh, so it's like a global controller taking decisions, the local controller takes decisions and you have to way of, you have to figure out how to combine the two, right? And blending is one way, it works for continuous action. There could be other ways of uh, choosing one over the other and so on. So that is where it becomes kind of interesting how to actually do that kind of a mixing. And uh, uh, and then you can also, you know, of course, this is a hyperparameter. You have to figure out, you tune it, you play around with different values. That's what they did. But maybe there are ways of estimating this and adapting it and things like that. It could be based on the network condition, for example, and so on. So uh, I think, again, this is a kind of an interesting uh, uh, approach and uh, opens up some interesting uh, problems, I think, to explore as you go forward. Uh, the... Uh, you know, another recent uh, direction where this is going is that, um, you know, to do this kind of uh, blending, you know, can you actually infer the intent of the user, right? So that way you would be, you would have a better chance. See, all these things, they help to hide the latency in some sense, right? I mean, if I knew that I was going to reach for a certain object, then uh, even if I don't have the network, momentarily I can continue with that path because I know that that's what you wanted to do. Right? So that is the idea out here. So you have to infer the, uh, the intent. And uh, in this particular example, uh, there could be multiple objects. And then uh, on the local side, you have to kind of uh, somehow have a, a belief uh, state which says that this is the, you know, there could be multiple possible 
this is what the user actually wants to do. And uh, you can have then use that to actually generate the policies in the robot side. So you have two things going on. One is to es keep estimating and updating the belief of the user and then uh, use that belief to actually generate your own policies. And that is what is reflected out here. So unlike in the previous approach where you merge the two action of the user and your own action here, you use the user's action to kind of really uh, update the belief state right, of what the user wants to do. And then you use that to run your own um, policy engine to extract the policy and run it. So uh, again, you know, these are, I would say, uh, I don't, you know, I think there are a lot of issues and challenges uh, even with these works. So these are all, I would say, steps towards <laughs> the final probably uh, solutions uh, as you go forward. So there are a lot of op you know, open questions out here, right? So for example, uh, right now, these are things which work for specific kinds of tasks, right? I mean, you want to reach objects and their objects are different colors or types or shapes, you know? Yeah, so it's a reach task. But then what if I wanted to uh, do other tasks? You know, you, could, you need to have a distribution over tasks themselves. Right, uh, toppling something or closing a door or uh, whatever it is, right? And I think that makes it even harder uh, to handle these. So uh, again, this is I think an exciting area to kind of uh, look at uh, for doing further research out here. Um, so, so those were some examples of how people have been trying to overcome inefficiencies in the network, right? Either improve the network or look at ways of managing the scarce network resources intelligently across different data streams, or bring in some local autonomy uh, and you know and, and enable uh, local decision making to hide the you know latency. Right? Um, there are there is this, also this challenge of actually on the operator side, recreating the environment which the machine sees, right? so that the human can make uh, the right decision. Right. So I'll just show you an example out here of how important that is. Right. So here it is. Uh, so in our lab out here, we have this robot arm from KUKA to which we have attached a interesting uh, humanoid type gripper out here. Right. And uh, <coughs> Avnish is wearing a a glove. Uh, which is localized, and the position of the glove and uh, the state of the glove, whether you're, I mean, in a farm, whether you're opening or closing, can be detected and sent to this. And as the arm is moving, uh, uh, initial arm is moving, the robot arm is also moving out here. But you see, it is so difficult for him, right? I mean, it's almost, it's really difficult to pick up these objects, mainly because the perception is trying to make sense of what is happening from where they are. So you really need to provide a perspective of the environment as the machine sees it through the machine. So it's a get transformed to match to the operator's perception. Right? So you need to render the workspace in the operator's sensory field and also transform it to match the perceptual capability of the operator. And there are a lot of technologies to do that now. Virtual reality headsets are fairly becoming common. Augmented reality headsets are there. And of course, you can still do a lot of things with just plain video displays, graphics displays, you know, audio cues, etc., etc., right? Uh, in addition, what is interesting is that, uh, uh, you know, with these technologies of force sensors, uh, 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 you know, and then uh, touch sensors, uh, texture sensors, I mean, that is, a, I, I would say, still uh, uh, something uh, still needs to be developed in open area. You can actually give those feedback also. So you know when you have touched an object because you feel that sensation in your hand. Right? Uh, so that, and then you would kind of, if I could also know that the object is bending a little bit, then I can adjust the force I'm applying. Right, so that's where the haptic and force feedback is important. Smell, you know, we have so many different sensory organs, right? Can we actually use all the modalities and uh, co communicate with the human object, right? Uh, and uh, finally, ultimately, neurostimulation, right? And that we have seen probably in the Avatar movie, how you can actually, in the Avatar movie, uh, there is a complete neurostimulation because the plug is put in the spinal cord. Right? <laughs> so you can, you can kind of, uh, fully activate the human brain uh, by the sensory uh, data which comes from there. And the neurostimulation is not far off. Actually, a lot of that, that technology are also advanced, and, and I, don't, I, I see that also becoming quite uh, commonplace over the next decade or so. Uh, finally, uh, a challenge out here is, besides, of course, these hardware technologies that you need to develop, another important challenge is how do you, it has to be low cost, and also you, know, you need to make it adaptive to each individual. That, uh, uh, 
you know, you don't sit and customize for every human and spend a lot of time that adds to the cost. Um, so, you know, then you, you have this other dual problem, right, where the human is taking actions, or maybe they have an intent, and you need to communicate that to the machine and match it to the capabilities of the machine so that the machine can do the effective thing, right? And uh, I'm kind of sh showing that in this uh, graphic, cartoon graphic out here, where the human could interact through a variety of uh, devices. I mean, you just, I'm just showing a few examples out here. You have a standard joystick, which you use. Uh, you could have a steering wheel in the context of driving something. This is another device, like a remote control with accelerometer. You know, you could have a simple smartphone, for example, right? That's kind of the ultimate low cost device. Or you could have other complicated you know, kind of devices which can detect your you know, vision based, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then on the right side is the machine, which has a number of degrees of freedom, right? Um, and really the problem here is to match the actions uh, across to the actuator degrees of freedom out here. And you need to kind of, you know, can you create an universal mapping entity, right? Uh, which can easily adapt to different modalities and you know, operators on one side and different kinds of machine on the other side. Uh, how do you kind of do that actually? So I think that's kind of an interesting uh, problem. Um, right now, I think it's kind of custom and uh, you know, kind of customized and individually developed for every every pair out here. Um, finally, of course, uh, this is kind of uh, probably the most uh, uh, <clears throat> you know in terms of uh, the, the the implication of AI uh, and ML technologies. This has the most implication on this aspect of increasing the abstraction level of human machine interactions. Right? Um, you know, can you like use gestures to kind of inform the machine what needs to be done? Can you just talk to the machine right, using speech? Or uh, other multi-modalities, right? Uh, kind of combine speech, gestures, you know, uh, and, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, inputs uh, you get from the human. Like, for example, you might have an EEG, a skull cap, which you might put and so on. And uh, this is where I think there's a lot of uh, intersection with ongoing AI research, where you can bring in advances in speech and vision or language and vision or, you know, things like that. And uh, this is something which uh, we have also started uh, exploring in a kind of a brief way out here. So um, some very early work, uh, one of, uh, you know, this is the work done by Sagar, who is a PhD student in the EC department. And uh, <clears throat> uh, basically what he has, you know, what he has done is how you could kind of uh, use gestures to figure out and get the robot, tell the robot what it needs to do. And here, the, the task is very simple uh, to the robot. The robot has to essentially uh, uh, pick up an object based on whatever has been pointed to out here, right? So, uh, so he's pointing to this object, blue object, and uh, really the way it works is, uh, sorry, just one second, I'll just pause. So this is the, this is the architecture uh, which Sagar has developed out here where you have a, a you, this is the actual scene uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and the user is pointing to an object. Uh, in this case, as you see, it's a blue disc. And uh, the goal is the robot has to kind of go ahead and pick up that blue disc, right? And so this architecture enables, what it produces in the output is the uh, target, the, the coordinates of the object. Right? That's what it uh, produces uh, at the output. And then that coordinate is fed to the robot and the robot goes and picks it up. And I, I won't go into the details of this architecture, but you know the the, <laughs> the modern approach to doing these things is to create a differentiable architecture, and then give lots of data, and then you know train this uh, uh, system through uh, backprop and uh, you know the existing optimization techniques uh, for it to learn, uh, and and then generalize, right? So that is basically the the kind of the recipe for doing all these things. And the, really, the cleverness is in identifying this architectural pieces and how you propose these loss functions and, and, and so on. And uh, basically, uh, that's what uh, Sagar has done out here. And uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll, in the interest of time, I'll not go into the details of uh, how this is done. It's been published in last year in uh, IROS 2020. So here, as you see, uh, this is just where it's training and it goes and picks up there. Now, it has remembered that it needs to go to and pick up a blue object. So this is uh, 
this is where you know these are the various steps and eventually it localizes the blue object out here and the robot goes ahead and now picks up the blue object it's in a different position if you notice so now it's pointing to the different object and the machine learns that okay it needs to pick up that object so now if the object is in a different location it can still go ahead and you know localize and pick it up so these are essentially uh, kind of you know helps to relieve the cognitive i mean kind of the mechanical routine uh, even teleoperation can be quite uh, painful uh, so this helps to increase a lot of abstraction though you might argue that in this case why can't you just localize the object in the cursor using a cursor and just get the robot to do it. but this anyway is an interesting approach and it might have other applications so uh, you know i also mentioned about speech uh, and and language so of course we we are still working on speech uh, you know and, and then uh, this is where we are looking at language and this is work again sagar has done in collaboration with some of the others uh, including uh, vikram uh, who's at jump faculty and partha from cbs and so on and uh, here uh, the idea is to essentially uh, use uh, uh, text and give instruction to the robot as to what to do so for example it's telling you know pick this object and place it above the other object and uh, again you know you come so the challenge here is to combine language and uh, vision together and uh, you know kind of get to a common shall we say understanding that um, a text piece of text refers to an object in the vision scene right so that is really where a lot of work is going on right now and uh, uh, so here basically uh, some initial shall we say progress has been made it in uh, undertake you know kind of executing these tasks where text is given so what uh, what here it is doing is very simple it's just parsing the text and identifying the source coordinate and the destination coordinate and then the robot uses its conventional algorithm to kind of execute the task um of course uh, you know uh, ideally you would like the robot to kind of you want to be able to tell the robot for example in the context of a nurse uh, you know please give a cup of water to the patient right so the remote the operator nurse is sitting somewhere and commands the robot please give a cup of water to the patient and then the robot has to understand that and actually go ahead and do that so that is kind of the ultimate goal we want to reach to uh, i think we are quite a ways off from that uh, reaching that goal and uh, <coughs> sorry i just uh so that brings us to uh, our ongoing project where we are trying to combine um you know a lot of these uh, activities in a in a single problem statement so to speak right and and the problem statement is essentially uh you have a robotic nurse uh, which is uh, operating somewhere far away from where the physical human nurse is and the human nurse is controlling this robot and uh, you know kind of giving care to a patient so that is the basic uh, problem statement and actually um really the if you see out here what is different compared to uh the zoom or the, i guess the teams call we are having right i mean we are projecting our image and speech across but beyond that we also want to project and undertake physical interactions on the remote side right so that is kind of what makes it really interesting and challenging um so um you know so this is this is uh, i think there are a lot of use cases around this so that's why this technology is kind of interesting and we are kind of uh, uh, using this as a use case to kind of uh, uh, kind of you know explore the various challenges and uh, develop this and what we are using for this is a robot made by a company called hansen robotics uh, which actually was in the news for the last few years because they made this robot called sofia and uh, sofia's usp is that it has about 30 or so motors in the face out here so it can express uh, you know <laughs> you can kind of uh, kind of move all kinds of uh, in, in different ways the facial uh, features and in some sense and make it appear as if it's uh, expressing emotions right so which you see on the bottom out here of course this is a uh, computer graphic the rendering of sofia uh, uh, but the idea here is that the operator frowns and the sofia also frowns of course it's not a perfect likeness out here so that is that is where there's an interesting challenge out here right how to i mean that that brings up another interesting uh research challenge which i already mentioned right mapping uh the operator's uh shall we say actuation to the degrees of freedom which are available in the actual robot 
uh, but but this is the robot we have and then the the robot has these two arms it has a gripper uh, and uh, it has eyes which have camera but for this particular in this demo i'm going to show you we have not used the eye camera but we are working on that to try to make it work there is this separate head mounted camera out here and the whole robot is mounted on a mobile platform this platform has been made by tcs uh, and so this is in in the lab in uh, the boss center right now uh, this slide they might it looks a little busy but i'll just uh, kind of briefly explain uh, let me make sure okay i think i'm kind of running out of time out here so i'll have to kind of speed up uh, so uh, so there are a lot of different technologies uh, uh, <laughs> really to make this work uh, you know you have to kind of uh, use the microphones on this side and uh, render it on this side you know so so that when ash you know you speak to asha asha has to be able to localize where the person is and turn the head right uh, uh, which means the operator has to be given a, a cue as to where the sound is coming from and they have to turn the head we haven't yet uh, kind of uh, worked that out yet but uh, there are a lot of other things you know the motions out here are translated head motions to the motions there and uh, and then the arm position had to be kind of transferred there through inverse kinematics and so on so again there are some engineering challenges which uh, uh, the team has been working on the other interesting thing out here is this uh, speech interface right so one of the things is uh, you know we also want the operator to be able to command asha right and so we have this flow out here where there is a wake word called asha and when that is given then asha actually uh, treats the rest of the uh, sentence as a command to it uh, if that word is asha is not there then it just passes on and plays it at asha and i'll just show you that and again uh, uh, you see out here uh this is a, uh i'll just explain what this team aha mem semi final is asha so this asha is the is nurse happy. operator and you see asha is happy so when she said asha is happy it's a command to asha to express the uh, uh emotion of happiness unfortunately the it was little far to see the face Uh, but maybe you can see so she is operating the asha by controlling the foot pedal asha has come forward and ravi teja is the patient out here and these are the cam uh, views seen by the cameras uh, on the head please hold out your hand please hold out your hand so i just wanted to pause here uh, just to bring out uh, two problems so you see out here the latency right when she said please hold it took almost uh, like about half a second for asha to render so there is a lot of latency out here and uh, also the intonation and the way the style was completely lost out here and i'll tell you uh, why it is lost and that also is an interesting problem which you're working on it's a very robotic voice on this side oh good you do not have a fever anymore you do not have a fever anymore asha is happy now you see her smile Would you like any assistance? Would you like any assistance? I could bring you a glass of water. Okay, sure. Let me get that for you. Okay. So let me get that for you. Okay. I, I I'll just pause this here because I'm kind of badly running over time so sorry about that I'll just uh, quickly wind up and just to kind of tell you that this is in the context of a uh uh competition organized by Xprize um which uh, they call it the avatar competition they want the teams to develop the avatar technology so you can project yourself and they are going to evaluate the the success of the, the teams based on how immersive the technology is that is both on the operator side the operator should feel that they are immersed in the inside the avatar similarly the person on the other side who is interacting with the robot should feel that it's a very natural interaction right they are actually interacting with the operator and the uh, the robot just kind of disappears into the background right and the, the the team which can do that the best will kind of win this prize of a 5 million dollar prize and uh, we are here i think our you know there have been about 38 teams shortlisted i think there were 90 or 100 teams of which 38 have been shortlisted for semi finals including the team from isc in combination with this and the semi finals is in uh, in september hopefully we can uh, <laughs> we can participate in the semi finals subject to the covid situation um so uh, i think this is the last uh, but one slide last slide actually almost 
so there are a lot of very interesting challenges uh, one uh, one of the things here is uh, uh, you saw you know the smile maybe you know sometimes uh, uh, when the robots try to become too much like humans they don't succeed and it falls dramatically you know people creep out that is called the uncanny valley right so how do you cross this uncanny valley for social robots right so where uh, in the attempt to make it more humanoid actually you kind of make it worse uh, so so and 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 what people have analyzed and found is that the rendering has to you have to really get it right you know how you render the emotions i mean the the, fe the features um and then uh, uh, there are uh, there are of course uh, opportunities on the uh, sensing side developing new sensing modalities uh, texture sensing and also being able to render it on the operator side speech is a big uh, is going to be a big game changer for these things especially any to any speech uh, translation where if you're also able to preserve the the style the emotional content the intonations uh, you know then you really create a natural way of interaction and uh, and then when you ex abstract out the level of interaction with the machine you want to be able to infer the intent uh, of what the person wants the robot to do and also take that intent and translate it into actual action and again that is a very hot area of research ongoing research right now i don't think anyone has really fully cracked that particular problem and then of course uh, uh, in, in, you know uh, having a multimodal interface uh, where you have all these different modalities uh, and then Uh, and then as you go forward uh, you would really want to bring in more and more autonomy capability in this uh, machine uh, where uh, you infuse it with uh, the robot needs to know that if the cup has water don't tilt it and if you fall water will fall right so common sense like this so so uh, it's really kind of intersecting very much with uh, agi artificial general intelligence and 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 have a way by which this can, these kind of machines are able to continuously learn and adapt because in the beginning they will not have but if you put in a framework where they can learn and adapt then uh, over time they'll become uh, smarter so that those are some of the i would say really exciting areas to kind of uh, work on as we go forward so um, and people have kind of looked at uh, these tele robots right versus autonomous robots right from a social setting and there are a lot of papers and there's just a recent paper which has actually done an extensive uh, kind of experimental survey type study and have figured out that people actually prefer uh, to think of these robots as equipment rather than as a coworker so we are not there yet uh, so it kind of further uh, kind of enhances the case for tele autonomous or tele operation right? i mean you kind of want to have these robots but if a person knows that the robot actually has a human behind it then they are more comfortable so i, I think just to kind of add to the the you know the promise of tele autonomous intelligence where your the communication network is allowing you to decouple the agents involved in this uh, collaborative right the agents need not be physically together you are decoupled because the communication network allows you to do and uh, and also this is a intermediate step to full autonomy in the future perhaps if people, the society accepts it and a artificial intelligence allows you to decouple intent from action right and uh, what we believe is that there is a huge uh, opportunity you have seen business process outsourcing we we provide a lot of jobs in india so why can't this kind of uh, you know tele operation you know type jobs be uh, developed in india as uh, you know you could have centers you could have people in villages you know operating machines which are in uh, say us doing lawn mowing or you know whatever right so i believe there is a lot of potential for uh, these technologies in the future uh, so with that uh, uh, you know i would like to really thank uh, all my collaborators uh, in ec in art park boss center uh, the many students and staff who have been working on this because Uh, this is really a uh, kind of you know requires a lot of people to come to the to the to do this kind of work so and then also the funding agencies with that i just stop here and i apologize for the running over a little bit yeah thank you bharat bhai it was a very interesting talk and uh, audience if there is any question there are any questions please uh, raise your hand or you can even post it in the chat window yeah i think jay prakash has a question yeah please unmute yeah. so Um, i have one question regarding this uh, asha nurse so uh, what are the regulatory steps involved in going commercial with that hmm <laughs> i don't really uh, uh 
you know we haven't spent too much time you know exploring that i'm sure that is uh, that that is something we will need to do yeah but we haven't done that already so i don't have an answer to that yeah but clearly safety is a very big uh, requirement and even in this competition for example uh, one of the important things is we have to demonstrate to them that we have all the safety features here so for example we have this button uh, you know which you press and just stops the the, the robot just stops uh but you know that had itself not be enough i think uh, uh yeah so 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 i think it's important uh, aspect safety but uh, we are we are working at it from a technology and research perspective but on the regulatory side i don't know the answer to that yeah i think we have some to go we have to develop it demonstrate hopefully the regulators get informed by this and i'm sure we need to show a lot of proof that it's a safe technology and uh, hopefully after that they will <laughs> accept it yeah so the reason i am asking that is because a simple example of uh, a nurse right so they administer and um, administer this iv injections mm. right are there any studies on how how these kind of uh, robotic technologies work in giving iv injection how safe it is and knowing uh, the proper concentrations which they are injecting and whether the injections are disposable or not and these kind of stuff yeah. correct correct Yeah, yeah, I mean those those are uh, things. We, I mean, you know, you take the problem of uh, injection, right? Giving an injection, we haven't. I don't think our technology is there yet where you can have a robotic nurse give an injection. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, I guess you, uh, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you see, you have to kind of hold the patient's hand. You have to insert the needle in the right place with the right force. Uh, I think it'll, it, you know. <laughs> uh, I, it will take some time uh, i think but uh, those are interesting problems which you need to first try out on mannequins yeah, measure it and then uh, you know from that then go to animals and then human service thank you there is a question posted in the chat window uh, by pratap kumar das how is the autonomous driving project different from uber's already developed automatic driving project Yeah, the Uber's project actually, uh, the, 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 what we are doing is the tele driving, not autonomous driving. And uh, uh, autonomous driving uh, is essentially, uh, you know, fully where uh, the algorithms in the car make the decisions, driving decision. Whereas in what we are trying to do, the human driver is making the decision, except the human is somewhere else over the network. And the reason we started on this uh, use case was essentially we were focusing a, a little bit at that time more on the you know kind of uh, the communications uh, activities right? uh, because it, it provides a very stringent requirement on the communication requirements so so yeah so they are kind of different they will eventually merge but uh, they, they are looking at different okay any other questions I had a question. So uh, these latency times you had mentioned, right? With this promise of uh, all this edge computing and all that, do you expect these numbers to go down, or there already uh, standards for that, or those need to be developed? See, the latency numbers are more a property of the network, right? The communication uh, infrastructure. so the edge computing uh, essentially gives you a mechanism to hide the latency by doing a, a decision you know kind of taking a decision closer to where the device is and cut down the latency yeah so uh, standards are certainly uh, coming up uh, uh, you know so uh, standards are things like how do you kind of uh, distribute the compute have the you know compute migrate as close as possible in automated way you know things like that i think those are things uh, which are the i think the cloud computing uh, group of people probably look at those things okay. any other questions okay, i think uh, gaurav has a question please unmute Hi Bharadwaj um thank you for the wonderful talk um I had a question about uh, sensor fusion and uh, sort of adding to what Varun just asked about edge computing so as our ability to see things perhaps you know beyond uh, visual uh, spec 
spectrum increases, right? I mean, autonomous driving already makes extensive use of robots. I'm sorry, radars. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, you know, if you could even see infrared, which we've seen for a long time, and add more and more parts of the spectrum that's available for uh, the intelligence to take a decision, whether that's machine intelligence or human intelligence remotely. Uh, how do you see this changing the whole uh, telecontrol scenario as more and more sensors uh, are added and fused into the mechanism? Yeah, yeah. Certainly, I think uh, the the, <clears throat> the point is the see there is someone who is making a decision. Uh, you know, it is either a piece of code or it is a human. And uh, as long as uh, you you do you know, if something helps improve the decision making quality, then certainly that is most welcome. Uh, but as you know, sometimes uh, too much information also leads to paralysis. <laughs> so there is a. I think there is a, uh, especially for humans, uh, not for probably automated programs. Um, so uh, uh, I think uh, there is a challenge of, uh, uh, and I, I kind of alluded to earlier, how do you present the information to a human in a way which the human is able to consume and do the right thing with it, right? So when you have all these different modalities, uh, suddenly you have hyperspectral imaging, right? I mean, a human is not used to seeing that kind of images. So how do you kind of present it to the human? Uh, so I think there are those kinds of interesting problems are there, uh, and clearly different modalities. I, th I think I think the I think it's most welcome to use these different uh, sensors because it gives you additional information. But then you have to see how to present it in the right way in case you have a human operator, so that they can make sense of it. But humans are amazing at learning and adapting, so one should take advantage of that also when we design these systems, that we should train the humans also, and. Any other question? Looks like yeah, no other question. So let's thank uh, Professor Bharadwaj once more for the very interesting talk. And thanks to you, audience, for attending this webinar. And we hope to see you uh, next time. And there is uh, all the best for the competition for your, to your team. Thank you. Thanks uh, to everyone for attending. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah.